Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of the Coach Joe Rolami podcast. I will be bringing you content with some of the best sport personalities around the world and sharing their journey with the listeners and inspiring the next generation. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce my special guest for today, Trishan Patel. Welcome Trishan. Hi Gerald, thanks for having me on man. Anytime man, thanks for coming on. So we'll just get into it. Um, if you can just share with us how you got into coaching and uh, your background in coaching. Um, so I'm 32 now. I've been coaching since I was like 18. I remember being at college, uh, stuck on a kind of course where I, I didn't actually really want to be on. It was like a leisure and rec. Uh, I did it because there was a, uh, a football kind of um, part to it. Um, and then we had someone come in to the college um, asking about maybe some coaching abroad, coaching in America. Um, I kind of went home and just filled in, filled in the forms, not really thinking of anything of it. Within two weeks, I was in London in an interview and they'd accepted me to come on. I had no coaching experience, really. I, was, I did my level one, but I actually hadn't coached before. So um, it all happened really fast. And I'm, I'm really glad that it did because my experience there was unbelievable. I got through like six different states on the West Coast. Wow. Um, I stayed in like um, different family homes each week. So I didn't know where I was going, but the families were so kind and and welcoming and I got a basic experience of of coaching and um that that really sparked me as soon as I came back I knew from there look I, I want to coach I, I want to this is what I want to do I want to work with young people I want to coach football it was just an unbelievable experience really mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so just just going through that period what how, do you would you recommend for anyone uh, a young coach to to step out of the comfort zone and and go to different environments like you said you went to the states and you experienced different things and, How and much that, of a, yeah that was it for me that was that yeah. was really it in terms of like um, being out of my comfort zone it mm. really made me grow I had to like kind of fend for myself um not even just like coaching wise like socially because I was like one of the youngest coaches there and I had to kind of really adapt and try and make friends and, and which I did luckily like everyone there, uh, the coaches the staff they were also welcoming they understood I was the young pup so a, a few of them kind of took me under their wing and I'm still friends of some of them today you know um they were mm. all in football so uh no just an unbelievable experience and I, I would definitely recommend any uh young people or even like middle-aged coaches just mm. just get yourself out there get, get yourself out of your comfort zone and and and, and go out there yeah so when you when you came back when you came back to to the UK so originally you're from Luton is that right or I'm from Luton yeah okay so did you did you come back to Luton after yeah, your no, story in America I, yeah I came back from from Luton but then like I, I I knew that I wanted to go straight back so I came back and and got like a part time job for six months just so I can okay. stay go back so I went back the second time for six months uh, first time I went I was there for three months. Um, and Chicago was my place, so I kind okay. of asked the director okay. and kind of be based there. It was unbelievable. So, um, also, when I came back, I, it made me think about my coaching too. So I thought, right, I've got a basic level of of coaching. Now I just need to kind of keep – I need to stay on the field to keep coaching. Mm -hmm. um, I felt as if um, I was learning quite a lot. So I got a job at um, uh, one of these, you know, playfootball.net, you know, those yeah. uh, I was delivering football birthday parties. So okay, for two, yeah. hours, two hours, I was just up there every Saturday to maybe, and then as I got, as I got good, I had like actual like parents starting to request me, you know, mm -hmm. um, my coaching got so to a decent level. And this is when I actually thought, you know what, I could actually take this a little bit higher. So I started carrying on doing my badges, my coaching badges. Um, then, you know, you obviously, you know, do you know, Butch, Butch Fazal is, is part of like, uh, the FA now. He was, um, yeah. Yeah. He was a big mentor of mine growing up. He's local. Um, he was one of my mentors and he got me a, a little job in schools. So I was mm -hmm. actually delivering not just football, I was delivering like different sports. And again, that took me to a different level because I had to coach other sports, you know, that I wasn't familiar with. But mm -hmm. it's definitely improved me because I had to adapt. Again, foot coaching's about adapting, isn't it? Straight away mm -hmm. on what you plan is as well as you want but you know and, and I know that you get to the session and something else kind of like pops up yeah. you've got to change uh, but mm -hmm. part of it, man. 
So when you was in America, was you coaching every single day in America? Uh, yeah, I was coach. So the, the, the day was honestly, what the lifestyle was fantastic. I'd wake up, have breakfast, um, and finish coaching by one o'clock. And then the rest of the day was kind of just for you. So we as coaches, we we used to go and explore, obviously, wherever we were. Families used to be hell-bent on taking us out. Like, even, like, we'd be given, like, basketball tickets, baseball tickets. Mm. You know, we were like the celebs. Living a life, mate. Yeah, coming over. So we were treated really well. So, yeah, it was a great experience. So do you think from coaching every single day, and like you mentioned, it, you didn't really have much experience, but you getting thrown into the deep end, do you think that was um, beneficial for you in any way? I, I always, like, I work with young people, obviously, in schools, and I always... Yeah. Like tell them to really appreciate, you know, when things are, when you feel a bit uncomfortable, I mm -hmm. think when you grow the most, I think you've got to really embrace that, uh, that awkwardness and that being mm -hmm. uncomfortable. I definitely, definitely, uh, think that that kind of period really taught me about myself, you know, mm -hmm. um, I thought I was, I actually came away thinking I'm actually more patient than I thought I was. Mm -hmm. Um, it was just like that connection with the young people, seeing them have fun, smiles on their faces, and like even them just like in the morning coming to give you a high five. Like they really appreciated what you did. Mm. It just made me feel so good. You know, you can't put a price on that. No, that's amazing. I can definitely relate to what you're saying. Um, as as a coach, you know, a lot of people think that it's it's glamorous, and you know, because you're doing what you enjoy. What difficulties did you come across when you first started coaching? Um, I would say I felt it more in the last couple of years when I went self-employed. Um, like I created these programs, right, uh, for schools. Uh, and I was actually going for a really tough time at, um, mm. during that period. I lost my dad and I was just, a, now looking back, I can see I was just a bit lost. So I kind of just left my job I should have probably stayed on a little bit more to be honest I just kind of took the risk and I was approaching all these schools and um not all of them were getting back to me and I was thinking oh my god like uh yeah this is going to be tough because I had bills to pay mm. you know? luckily I, I still had like good contacts in schools where um where I used to go so the school my high school up the road I contacted them and they, they invited me in and we had a chat and they bought some programs off me and um wow I think like just recently I felt like, you know, being a coach, like you said, like the, the, per the perception is, oh, it's all like fun and games, but I've got, I'm, I'm so, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm like on my own. So I've got to spend for mm -hmm. myself. You know, I really rely on these contracts. Now the schools are closing down now because of the coronavirus. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. back to a, a space where I'm a bit lost. I don't know what's going to happen, but at the same time, Throughout my journey, I've just built my self confidence up. You know, I, I I just believe regardless of what happens, I trust myself to kind of find a way, and that's been the mentality throughout my career, throughout my life. Is simply find a way. The people that have been in my lives, my my mum, my dad, my granddad, my my nan, they're all grafters, you know, and I've just learned from them. Like I just think, regardless of what situation you're in as a coach. Um, You've just got to keep going, you know? You've just got to keep going mm. and keep finding your way. That was powerful, man. That was powerful. No, I agree with you 100%. You know, it's especially like tough times, like you said, you know, you losing your father. I'm sure that must have been, uh, you know, because when you're on a pitch, you have to be fully focused on your sessions and, and being present with the kids. But when you when you go through your own you know trials and tribulations and things are happening off the pitch is yeah. it's very very difficult to stay focused on a pitch. No, but do you uh, know what? How difficult. Yeah, go on. It's it's like strange that you said that, like, but because mm. like actually football gave me that therapy. I, like this okay. is I'm okay. so grateful to the game. Like it has given me so much more than I could ever kind of ask for. Uh, when I was in bed, I knew I had sessions in the afternoon, but I was just locked away in my room, curtains down in bed, literally just kind of just, yeah, straight. I was just crying. I was just like, mm. just in a bad way. I was just, but then like, as soon as that time came for me to put the sessions on, mm. I knew I had a purpose. I had, mm -hmm. I had, I had to serve someone and it actually got me out of bed. And for that hour, 
I was actually happy, you know. And it's just, mm. it's just like, you, it's just when you come home and then reality hits again. But I was just getting like these little, little, little kind of injection of of happiness and mm-hmm. each hour from these clients. These clients are actually making me feel happy, and I was making them feel happy. And I, honestly, mate, I'm I'm just so grateful f- to this game. It's given me a lot, and I'm sure it's going to give me plenty more ups and downs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Boys, isn't it? But I'm, I'm really grateful. Mate, that's yeah, that's amazing. And you just you found you basically found an outlet and used it to your advantage and said, you know what, this is my passion and you know, it's that's that's amazing, man. That's amazing. So you spoke about um that you was going to schools and selling the programs, etc. So what what made you start up your own uh football company? It it was actually or was it just football or yeah, just football, like um okay. like, and it and it and it was really this simple. It was like my dad passed away in September 2016, and I started my company in November 2016. So okay. he was always like one of my biggest supporters. He always encouraged me, just like my mum, really. They, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know, like I think the perception of like Asian families is they'll they'll kind of push you towards being a doctor or a solicitor. <laughs> and for me, but was that was that difficult? No, for me, time? that was that was it was completely opposite for me. Like, the okay. message there for me was. Do what you love doing because Amazing. it's going to be your job every day. And I'm so, again, I'm so fortunate that my, my parents kind of have an attitude like that, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so football was um, was clearly my, my number one. Um, I was actually I was actually an all right cricket as well. I represented um, okay. County. And my, my dad did say at one point, he said, look, you're going to have okay. to choose one. And just kind of go with it. And obviously I, I chose football. Football was my, mm. my main one. But... Um, yeah, again, it, there was a couple of reasons why, really, um, I kind of started off my own company. Like, one was to kind of, like, give myself that therapy. I knew football was good for me. Whenever I was coaching, uh, I was just in a good place. Um, the second one was really to kind of show coaches that there's a different way to do it. Um, mm-hmm. I think a lot of young coaches that were messaging me that had kind of followed my journey were saying, can you give me advice? Can you give me advice? And they were just saying about being in a pro club. And for me, my experiences, my experience, one of my experiences in a pro club was horrific, mate. Like, I stopped coaching for a year. This club kind of, like, really just didn't look after me in, in many ways. And I became disillusioned. And without my family and friends, I wouldn't have, co- I wouldn't have co- gone back into coaching. Um, I, I stopped coaching for a year. I lost confidence. Um, so this was also a kind of a fuel for me, you know, a bad experience to kind of actually yeah. show people what I can do, um, but also show them that, that there's a different way to kind of do things. And and like kind of finally, really, it was like, um, yeah, it was it was it was kind of like to kind of put value on myself because I'd lost a lot of confidence. I knew what I could do, but I didn't feel I was kind of um, valued or or. Or treated right, and that and that kind of. Why do you think that was though? Why do you think that was? Um, just a mixture of things, really. I, like me personally, I, I don't want to go straight to uh, the, the being like, uh, oh, they were racist. But I, mm-hmm. I still, I still think my color played a part in in their trust towards me because I can highlight, you know, like I used to turn up to session. They used to give me sessions with two, three people on, and someone new would come not Asian or black and and I would I was like one of the most highly qualified coaches there at the time I was a B license coach all these new coaches were coming were level one level two but they were getting better gigs than me you know Mm. and like I just questioned it and even the way like that like throughout my journey I can see it's 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 um it's a bit institutionalized you know I think Mm -hmm. like because there's not a lot of us in the in the elite game people's perception is ah they're not, they're not mm. like, they're not ready. They can't do this. Mm. But, mm. And I've got so many little kind of stories that I could tell where that these things are kind of highlighted. Like I, I remember starting a new job, right? I'm obviously not going to mention names or anything. And mm. um, I, I, I was at school. Um, I, I applied to be a football coach. I got the, I got the role. So this person took me around, um, took me into the staff room where everyone was, all the P staff room mm. there. Hi, this is Trishan. Um, can you guess what coach he is can you guess uh, what sport he is so he and he was what? laughing while he was doing this what he mean? knew that like you know like he knew that mm. no one or not many people would have said football coach because we had mm. we had a real hockey program there a cricket program there and he was going around people saying cricket coach 
And he was like, no. And he was laughing. Wow. And I thought, wow, like, this is like a professional environment. And, like, mm. I'm just getting taken taken for a mug, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I just felt so yeah. small. And I just thought, wow, like, is this, is this what people's kind of perceptions are? Not many people said football coach, you know? Mm. Uh, and this is the thing I can I can relate because, mate. Even though when when people first see me, they they see my skin color and they think you know he's he's a he's a white lad, but they look deep into it. And when I start speaking, and it's like, oh, where are you from? I'm like, oh, I grew up in Hackney. Yeah. Okay, and then they go deeper again, and they're like, oh, where are you originally from? Because your last name's not really English. And I'm yeah. like, oh, originally from Albania. And then that's where it all starts. You know what I mean? Because I've been in situations like that where. You know, I, I've had to lie about where I've come from to certain coaches when I used to play just for the sake of them thinking that I'm from from England, even yeah. though I grew up in England, you know, yeah. all my life, for them to, to see me in a certain way. And it's only when they found out later when I, I, I kind of just slipped up and I said I was going away on holiday. Um, and, yeah. was, and the coach was asking me, he was like, where are you going? I said, oh, I'm going to Albania. He said, what are you going there for? <laughs> And uh-huh. I, was like, I just, I just, re- I just realized oh, I haven't really mentioned to this guy that I'm from there. Yeah. But then from there, when I've come back, literally throughout the whole preseason, I'm not going to mention the club, but throughout the whole preseason, I was playing every single game. When I've yeah. come back from holiday, literally, I was just on the bench. Yeah, smart. And he can, and I've, I've walked into the office and I've said to him like, "What's happened?" And you know, like for the whole preseason, I've been playing, and you know, I had to go away. Like, why am I not playing anymore? And he's just like, oh, yeah, you literally went away and someone else is taking your position. I'm like, yeah, but I'm not even getting 10 minutes. No, like, not. literally nothing, do you know what I mean? So, in, in in a sense, these things do happen in football and a lot of people think because it's England and, you know, it's a it's a developed country, these things don't happen. But to to tell you the truth, they do happen and even, even worse cases than what I just explained. And, do yeah. you know what I mean? And that's the sadness of it. So, I do think you believe it's- that? Yeah, go ahead. It's, it's really hard, you know, when people, when you feel people can't relate. So we'd be mm. relaying these stories to people and like people can't really relate because they've not, they've not been in that situation or not experienced mm. that, you know. It's really hard to open out and talk about it. That's why I'm kind of glad that these kind of podcasts run so mm. uh, we can kind of express our kind of feelings uh, and, and our experiences and share them with each other. No, I 100% agree because I'm sure there's loads of coaches that have been in, in the positions that we've been in and they feel like they can't speak out, you know. I mean, like, look at even what's happening now in the football in in terms of players and the way they're not really getting backed up like that by the FA. And, yeah, it's just it's sad to see that we're in 2020 and, you know, things like this are still happening. Definitely. So, but do you, do you believe, you know, like BAM coaches will, will be given opportunities to get into higher positions in, in the near future um I think like it for me I've, I've always said it starts from the top and there are some really good initiatives kind of from the FA in terms of like I told you already like that I've been selected for a development group um in order mm. to check for my A license I think they are listening more whereas my my kind of view on the FA was kind of really negative a couple of years ago it's not until they actually started to engage and and actually I feel as if they're listening. Um, so mm-hmm. I've been to a few kind of their road shows and um, I think it's just going to take time. I think it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to need a lot of patience, but those people that are, are kind of um, frustrated, in the meantime, you've got to carry on. You've got to mm-hmm. kind of... Um, you've got to keep working hard and make sure that there's no excuses for you to reach wherever you want to get to. When you're angry, I think when you're frustrated, you can kind of have maybe adopt a give up like mentality. Like, oh, forget it, I can't be asked. You know, I don't, ah, oh, there's no point. What's the point? I think the moment you start doing that, the moment you take yourself out of the, uh, the picture. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially mm-hmm. if you want to get to that elite level, but, um, for me, like, you know, these decision makers, we always talk about decision makers, the people at the top that are making these decisions, that they're, they're, for me, they're predominantly all white. So I don't think we're going to get a fair and uh, a multicultural kind of view if there's if if it's predominantly white. I think we need to make sure that those decision makers at the top 
are multicultural. So when they do have these discussions on who to employ, um, uh, provisions to kind of like set up, then they've got a wider, a wider range, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, uh, I mean, if you, if you look at the players as well, if you look at all the, not all the players, but predominantly, if you look at all the players, they've come from the street levels. That's where you're going to find the best footballers. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. for coaches, you would you would have to try and find a way in understanding them because I've been in those positions again where coaches don't they never used to understand me, and it used to frustrate me on the pitch. Yeah. And then I would get a red card or I would lash out or I'd do this, and it, it just came down to always oh, got a bad behaviour, yeah. and you get released, yeah. but. You don't know what's happening in my life. You don't know that my mum and my dad are working hard to try and keep the lights on. And I'm having to find a way to come up to play these matches. You haven't asked me. Do you know what I mean? You haven't asked them. You've never been to my surroundings. So you you would never understand. But the minute that you get someone that's been around that environment and detects certain behaviors and be like, wait, hold up a minute. I, I can I can relate to that behavior. Why is he? Be, why what's going on here? You're right. What's what's happening at home? Is everything all right? And it goes back to what you were saying about like you know you asked about about a coach and like, why do you coach and that's one mm. of the reasons why like I, I feel mm. like I, I coach is is to help help others and and to kind of get down to that level. Sometimes you might not have experienced some of the things that you've mm. some of these kids are, are talking to you about, but You've got to have a, a sense of empathy. Um, you've definitely got to tr- just listen to them because that's one of the main things, just simply listening, you know. Mm. I, I don't think mm. they've, they've got, like, um, that support network always at home where they can kind of, especially young men, and, and I'll talk to you a little bit more, really, about, like, the goals program that mm. I kind of mm. up at school. It has all of those kind of things in there about dealing with your emotions, encouraging young people to speak uh, talking about mental health, setting goals and targets. These are all the things that I learn as a coach that are really mm-hmm. important. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, I mean, even if you look at the, the, the top end of the game, if you look at Liverpool, which is, for me anyway, I think they're the best team in the world at the moment, and you see the coach, you could see that these players actually play for Jurgen Klopp. Yeah. Like, yeah. the way he's such a, a great man management and... And you know, like no disrespect to these players, but like Robertson, he was he wasn't seen as one of the best left backs in the world. Right. Trent's come from the youth team, you know. Henderson just the other day, everyone was doubting him and saying he's one of the worst midfielders. You know, you Man. look at Milner, who's a who's a professional anyway. You look at Wijnaldum, who got relegated with Newcastle. So these players aren't top end players, but the way he's made them just gel together and just made them feel special. And you could see the results. I just think the way he kind of, like you said, like the way he carries himself, uh, the mm. way he talks and, and kind of shows respect to so many situations. Mm. I think like he's uh, he's the definition of what a leader should met, should mm. look like. I think mm. I read an uh, interview uh, from Jeannie Wijnaldum and he was talking mm. not just from the football side. He said he feels he can go and speak to the manager on anything, you know, and mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. that's so important that players uh, feel that they're not just footballers, they're human beings mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. And another one of the posts that you yeah. kind of, you kind of um, posted, weren't you? you, didn't you, about Ancelotti, about yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. these kind of philosophies is they're, foot, but they're humans first and footballers mm-hmm. seconds. And I really, I really like that. No, me too. I appreciate that as well because a lot of people... They look at these footballers and they just think, oh, they're robots. But at the end of the day, they've got the same feelings as everybody else. Do you know what I mean? They've got the emotion. They, one day they'll be happy, next day they won't be, they won't feel that great. But the thing is, they've got the pressures of putting on a facade or having an image every single day or every weekend that they step onto a pitch and perform. But, you know, and that's where a manager comes into place and, you know, make, make sure that, that, you know, that, that team spirit and everyone's feeling at a good level. Definitely. So it's important. So you spoke about um, your your goals program. How do you how do you set goals and targets for yourself? Um, so for me, like I always kind of like they always change and alter. Like mm. what I found 
of like as you kind of grow and develop things will change like your opinions mm. will you might think actually like I can go beyond that or do you know what I need to scale that down that it's about kind of being realistic as, as well um for me I, I always have a short term like medium and long term and kind of work my way backwards so I start off at like the question is where do I want to be so I want to be in a program right um I'm going to need to for me in order for me to be in the program I need to um at being a being a, an environment where I'm regularly coaching, I've got that people's way. And then the short term one is is a development group. In order for me to get on to the A license, I need to kind of be on that development group. So I just kind of start from the top and kind of work my way backwards, if you know what I mean, mm-hmm. and break it down. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's absolutely clear. I also use um vision board a vision board. You know, I don't know. Okay. You, okay. Have you yeah. Used yeah. It? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, got, I've had I've had a few vision boards that like you said the goals always change, but yeah. And like when someone kind of suggested this to me, I, like I, I kind of laughed. I, I didn't know what to kind of think of it, and I, I start I created one. And honestly, like I've actually incorporated that into my, into my goals program um, for mm-hmm. the students. It, it makes it absolutely clear, no matter whether you're in a good mood or a bad mood, it, it's you're absolutely clear on your goals and what you want to achieve. When you wake up, you look it in the morning. At night, you you look at it before you go to bed, and I just think you need some tools like that as well to help you with your goals. Mm, yeah, no, that's powerful. That's power, and and there's a lot of people that probably do know about vision boards, but they, like you said, some people don't really believe in it. But it's really powerful if you actually, because a lot of people think, all right, I'm gonna have a vision board, and I'm just gonna have it up in my room or wherever on uh, in my office. And things are going to magically happen. <laughs> it doesn't happen like that. You'd have to actually go and put in the work. Then yeah, yeah, you have to. You have to. So it, but teaching it to the young kids, what you're doing right now, that's powerful, me. And I'm sure this program that you got going on is going to impact a lot of young children. It's just going to be a a, a domino effect from generation to generation. So I hope mate, so. Salute, man. salute to you and a lot of people think you know oh, i just want to be in a program pro game and things like that but doing the groundwork is the most important thing for me like developing young players or just human beings is the most important thing for me like even when i'm coaching with juventus first and foremost when i look at them and i speak to parents i say football is second for me first is can we develop them as 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 people because not everyone's going to make it through football but if they don't make it, have we given them the tools? Have we given them the, you know, just everything in life that they can succeed? Yeah. You know? So, but from your program that you're doing, that's exactly what you're doing, mate. And it, I'm, I'm sure it's, it's, it's benefiting a lot of schools, young children, and it will definitely have an impact. And I just hope it grows bigger than what it is. I respect. I'm a like I said, I'm in. I'm in kind of talk with like the ECB. I've turned it into a cricket version as well. So, oh, uh, wicked, wicked. I've got, like other companies outside of England that are kind of interested in it. So, no, I'm, mm. I'm I'm really hopeful, and I've seen it firsthand. You know the 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 power it can have on on these young people. Mm. Mm. So we we spoke about um you know being adaptable as a coach. What what do you think are the most important attributes to have as a coach? For me, like the number one is like a love of helping people. I think you can talk about um, winning. You can try and get in mm-hmm. people to, to win. But ultimately, it, like you just mentioned before, it's, it's, it goes beyond football. It's actually mm-hmm. equipping them with the important life skills to, to succeed in their life. Like I always kind of... Um, I kind of uh, study these students when they're playing the actual mat- matches and I see I look at body language. I look at how they're communicating with each other and then we actually bring it back and, and say, like, actually, like when you were losing, did you actually notice a change in your body language and, and actually mm-hmm. your work? Right? How, what were you thinking in that moment? So we talk to them about having that resilience, you know, mentally. Um, so I think it's seeing the bigger picture. I think having a, a, a love for helping and developing I think that's for me. That's the probably most important thing. Uh, it's got to be fun. We all we all um, seem to learn better when it's fun. When it's boring, you kind of switch off, don't you? Mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. but bringing your personality, bringing your energy, uh, 
to the sessions that you coach? Yeah, yeah. I, I would say number one, um, just a, a love of helping people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, amazing. Um, would you say you've got a coaching philosophy in terms of playing styles or um, are you still developing it? Yeah, I, th- I think it's, it's one of them ones that kind of, it, it is always kind of developing. Um, mm. How I spoke about um, developing, especially from a youth perspective, when it comes to Biggles grade, it's senior football. So that kind of notion changes a little bit, whereas mm-hmm. it, it, there is a, a strong emphasis on winning. So senior football, when there's points to be kind of played and, it, and it's competitive like that, then we've got to kind of drum in. I, I want my teams to be, have a winning kind of uh, hunger, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I want them to be good, good humans, uh, always have like a team team first ethos and I want to be entertained there's been times this year at Biggles Wade where we've just kind of been within ourselves and I've told them at half time like go and entertain me boys like just mm-hmm. go and mm-hmm. just remember why you're here what's got you here it's because you were in that playground as a, as a young kid and you were mm-hmm. you were expressing yourself and that's what, what I want to see you know on the football pitch I want them to see enjoying their football so I want I want to be entertained as well Oh, amazing, amazing. So, so you said you mentioned you was at a Biggers Wade United. How how much has that improved you as a as a coach being there? Ah, oh, like this has been probably one of the most um, uh, educational seasons that I've ever had because it, it's it's my it was it was my first taste of um, senior football. So, okay. giving me a real insight on onto what senior football is like. Like I said. Um, there's a real big, big drive on 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 winning. Whereas in in youth football, where I've kind of worked mainly, it's about development, um, mm-hmm. guided learning. Whereas here, sometimes you just got to tell them what you want. You know, you don't. It's not about asking them questions. It's a. It's more of a command. There's more command. I find um, mm-hmm. there is lots of similarities and still in terms of managing people. Like even though they're adults, some of them still act like like babies. You yeah. know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're all at different stages in their um, maturity levels because we've got we've got the youngest squad in the league. Like our average age okay. is twenty two. Um, wow. Okay. Yeah. So we've got quite a, a young squad, um, but it's also given me. It's also like taught me about myself, and I've definitely got more self belief in terms of I. I feel like I belong here. Where at the start, I wasn't sure what was going to happen or how I would adapt, but I've definitely got some like self-confidence from being here we're third in the league we're we're fighting for promotion and we we just recently knocked out a team uh, a step above us to to make it okay. to a cup final so there's a lot of exciting things happening and I'm just so happy to be a part of that really no I've heard I've heard good things of um, Biggers Wade United at the moment um which by the sounds of it it sounds like a good environment you know especially I like the aspect of the young players which yeah. I'm not too sure how many clubs in a non-league are doing that at the moment in terms of giving the youth opportunities. Well, so like we, at the start, of the season, we had we had two players signed on. Like the team that finished fourth last year, they went and mm. followed the old gaffer to another team. Um, okay. So, so it's even the the story and the journey is like mm. we're we're just really enjoying that as well. And when we first recruited, we did recruit like technically gifted players, the a young kind of batch. Um, okay. But like we had to like another thing that I've learned is we had to really talk to them about the importance of working hard, and mm. and because at the start of the season we were losing games simply because we you know the basics of of working hard or or running mm. or uh, of transitioning from with with the ball to without the ball it wasn't there so that's definitely one thing that I've learned going into the new preseason next year is we're going to be doing a lot of transition work when we lose the ball. Because I think some young players are their YouTube, they're, they're, they're sort of, like, yeah. YouTube mentality, man. Yeah, when they yeah, yeah. they run fun, but when we haven't got the ball, they don't want to do it. So that's one thing I've kind of learned as well. Again, you look at the the best team in the in the Premier League, or two of the best teams, City and and um and Liverpool, and <laughs> they're based yeah. on running, even though they're yeah. based on yeah, possession I'm also. But it's unbelievable, you know, isn't it? Yeah. When the ball back is unreal. No, for for sure. So, in terms of recruitment at Biggleswick, how does it work? Do you guys just have an open trial, or no? We kind of you have a certain system. No, we just like 
me, the gaffer, and uh, the other coach, like we kind of get together and and we kind of use our links to kind of um, to kind of uh, recruit. Obviously, we've got a twenty three side where we promoted three or four um, from there. I think that's important as well because there's no point having a twenty threes otherwise if you're mm-hmm. not going to and give them uh, a pathway. But mm-hmm. we've kind of used our our footballing links. You know, everyone kind of. Um, networks and speaks to other club managers and sometimes you do each other a, a few favors you, you know like you just kind of say like listen i'll, I'll send this guy on loan to you mm-hmm. uh, if you know mm-hmm. any others can you kind of like send them my way and it's just a little small little network that we kind of use mm-hmm. it's been quite good no amazing and and for people that don't know where biggles wade united are from where, where are they actually located so it's uh i would say it's on the way kind of um towards Bedford. I don't know whether anyone knows where it is. It's it's only like thirty minutes from from Luton, actually. From Luton, so, okay. yeah. Um, yeah, we're in the South Midlands um, Prem League. So, yeah, we're hoping the season continues and we've got a chance to win a trophy and hopefully com- get promoted. The highest that the club's ever finished is fourth, which was last year. Okay. We're okay. currently behind third, so I don't really want the season to kind of just be voided. You know, I want to mm-hmm. see where it can go. No, I mean, I hope so as well. That's that, that's what I wanted to speak to you about as well. How, how do you think the finish the, the season will finish, especially because I know you're a Liverpool fan? Yeah, <laughs> what, honestly, what do you what do you think was going to happen? Stick from United fans, you know. Last <laughs> day, they're saying just avoid it, just cancel it. Yeah. Of course yeah, they would. Almost, man. Like you just kind of hope that it's safe yeah. enough to do so. We we were just in, in such an uncertain time. If I had it my own way, of course, like I'd want the season to be finished. Uh, so we can just get those two wins and 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 be crowned our crowned like the champions that we deserve. Well, we've been unbelievable this year. No, you have, you have, you have. But do you? But as a champion, you do want to finish off the thirty eight games, 100%, no? Hundred percent. Like people are saying, oh, what if the league kind of just handed to you? Come on, mm. I've waited thirty years here. Of course, <laughs> they're going to take them handing it to us. Yeah, yeah. but like. Uh, ethically, morally, you want to kind of earn that, and and you also mm. you want to celebrate in front of your fans. You know, Th- these mm. I've actually got tickets for all our home games, uh, but it's looking like they're going to be played but played behind closed doors. But like I'm, I'm hoping things kind of get better and we can have a summer parade. That would be fantastic. Mm. That would be unbelievable. Mate, I hope so. I hope so because you guys definitely deserve it. But do do you actually think that the games will will actually carry on behind closed doors? I I think personally that yeah they'll 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 um they'll carry on behind closed doors, and uh, I think it's just in every club's kind of financial interest more than anything to complete the league mm. because there's mm. so many kind of um, consequences for not finishing the league commercially and from a marketing point of view. That's what mm. I think will kind of be the power of it to to get done is is the is the money side. I I, mm. I just think that's that's what these big cats are kind of most worried about. Mm. Yeah, there's a lot of money in the Premier League, especially. It's yeah, huge, huge build. losses. Exactly. So let's but just take- you look at the lower leagues as well, in terms yes. of the, they're, they're affected also. They're most vulnerable. Man. They're most vulnerable. Yeah, yeah. I like to think that uh, like the top clubs in the Premier League would get together and, and put together mm. some sort of package. I know it's not um, their, their kind of uh, it's not, it's not, it's not up to them to kind of do that. But you've just seen people like your Gary Neville's, and uh, in the last couple of days, from mm. a human level, you know, just doing mm. some really kind things. I saw Pret are giving free drinks to the NHS staff mm. in this mm. climate now. I think that's a, such a, a powerful message in terms of like sticking together, doing the thing, doing the right thing. So no, I agree with you. I agree with you. Yeah, I just hope that just not just the football anyway. Yeah, just in general, I hope this situation gets sorted out sooner rather than later, and everything just goes back to normal. Because yeah, this is very inhumane. Like the way we're just living at the moment, everyone's just isolated at home. So yeah, hopefully, hopefully everything gets back to normal. Exactly. No, but yeah, Tris, thank you very much, mate. What, mate, your story and just your resilience is is very inspiring that you've created your own path. You didn't really let your situation or circumstances hold you back and even lose hope 
to to further your career and I, I hope anyone that's listening they can get what they can get out of it and just the fact that you know the the hard work determination creating your own lane creating your own environment coach environment you just kept going kept going and you're getting to the stage where you've worked up the ladder to working towards your UEFA A now which is a lot of people think that it's it's an easy pass but but it's not so truly mate hats off to you and I wish you the best of luck uh, yeah, for the rest that, of the season. Yeah. No, I appreciate that, and thanks for having me on, man. If no, that any time. Next, um, obviously, I'm on, I'm on um, Instagram at Trish and Patel Coaching. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. At Trish and Coach, and let's let's kind of connect together, man, and let's, yeah. let's do football. For sure, for sure. So yeah, anyone that wants to hit up Trish, please do, please do, man. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot, man.